Welcome to the Shadows in the Tesh watercolor rendering series presented by the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, Louisiana Chapter. My name is Kevin Harris, president of the Louisiana Chapter. This watercolor series furthers our ICAA LA mission to advance the appreciation and manifest the principles of classical and traditional architecture and its allied arts by engaging practitioners, students, educators, and architectural enthusiasts of Louisiana. From lectures and book signings by leading proponents, learned historians, historic tours, and continuing our workshops, as such as today's Exploring the Methods and Discipline of the Beaux-Arts Canons, the Louisiana chapter will continue to share and demonstrate the beauty and structure of those principles which form the foundation of our amazing and culturally responsive architecture and art. We share these educational offerings through email, info at classicist-la.org, Facebook at ICAALA, and our website, www.classicist-la.org. Please visit us to become more familiar with our past and future events and to learn more about what we advocate. If you're not already a member, please consider joining. Visit www.classicist-la.org and click the Join tab. Please check your Zoom chat box today where Elizabeth has placed these information links. Thank you for signing up for today's exciting workshop. As the day progresses, we will further explore how to present the iconic Shadows on the Tesh, Louisiana's National Register property, located in New Iberia. Today's workshop marks the third of our series of five, and we'll delve into the Beaux-Arts method presenting the plan view. As this series is focused on watercolor techniques, we have saved you the time and effort of drafting, as well as all drawings are provided in PDF format to print and trace onto your watercolor papers. Before we introduce our instructor, I would like to go over a bit of housekeeping. This is intended to be an interactive class. We want to address any of your questions as we progress through the workshop. Just open the chat box on your Zoom screen and type your question. Elizabeth Marchand, our chapter coordinator, will keep track and pass along your questions to today's instructor. This series is a result of diligent efforts from Laura Thomas and the, our board secretary and our education committee. I would now like to turn things over to Laura for some announcements regarding our upcoming classes and to introduce our esteemed instructor. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Charles, for uh, joining us today and teaching your personal techniques for watercolor painting. Um, we are very, very grateful to have you here today. Um, in our upcoming courses are um, the Class 4 section um, with Eric Bootsma on a Saturday, April 17th, um, from same time from 1 to 5 Central. Um, class 5 will be in Analytique with C.J. Howard, and that one will be on a Saturday in May, and um, we will be scheduling that very soon. Um, some more details to come in the coming weeks. So look, um, check your emails and Facebook for um, the Eventbrite for those two classes. Charles, um, now I'd like to introduce Charles. Charles Schaefer is a graduate of the master's program at the University of Notre Dame School of Architecture. He is a two-time recipient of the Castanga Foundation Fellowship for Graduate Study of Architecture. He has worked as an artist and designer, both on individual commission and for various firms in the U.S. and France. In practice at Skirman Architects in San Francisco, Charles specializes in the integration of new technologies such as virtual reality, computer rendering, and BIM with traditional design practices. At Notre Dame, he studied Ecole de Beaux-Arts techniques primarily under Richard Economakis, ward-renowned traditional architect and regular collaborator with the Princess Foundation. A native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and a former high school science teacher, Charles values a diversity of perspective on architecture and the word. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to you, Charles, to get started. We may think of this as a painting because we're using paints and we're using paint brushes and we're putting that down on the paper, but really what we would have called this in school and what our instructor insisted that we call it is a drawing. What we're doing is we are 
drawing uh, this particular plan, this particular building, in a way to explain or elucidate the design. Uh, and so we're going to attempt to do that with watercolor paints, uh, in addition to the drawing that you all should have down, um, to try to make more of the way that the building is put together clear, uh, to make uh, it very easy for someone without really any architectural understanding to look at this one image or look at a couple of these kinds of images and immediately understand uh, how the building is put together. So um, I see that there are perhaps some new participants uh, this time and some familiar faces. Welcome all. Uh, the last class that we all did together uh, was an elevation and it's easy to think that the elevation is more exciting uh, than the plan view. Uh, it's easy to think that that does a better job of explaining what's going on in the building or maybe does a better job of selling the building to someone that doesn't know what it is. But in fact, with any architectural background, you know that the plan is much more important to explaining how the building actually works. The problem is, is that plan drawings are, they're, technical. They're kind of almost engineering drawings. So how do we make them interesting? Um, if you've all traced the drawing that I sent out, that we sent out earlier in the week, you'll notice that there have been shadows sketched onto the plan. And what these shadows are, are conjectural. They're, they're made up. What we're imagining is that the convention of a plan drawing, which is that we've cut the building at a certain height um, and just shown you what's beneath it, uh, beneath that cut. What we're imagining with this particular drawing by casting shadows is that we've actually done that. We've actually taken a bandsaw and cut the whole top off of Shadows on the Tesh. And now we're using a light source, imagining the sun is up here somewhere, kind of in the direction of my camera, shining down on the building that we've cut apart. And the cut pieces are casting their individual shadows in the direction that the light is shining. So it's invented drawing. It's a kind of fantasy of what a plan might be if the plan were this kind of idealized perfect ruin of the building that used to be there. And the point, of course, is to really highlight the massing of the walls, the major structural elements, the things that when cut through will still cast these shadows. So enough talking. Um, Let's get painting. Let's begin by mixing a color. Uh, so though some of you may have been along for the ride last week, I'm just going to assume that we're all starting from scratch. Um, the first color that I want to mix is a color for poche. Poche is a uniquely French architectural concept, poche pocket. Um, and this color, uh, whatever color you use, and you can use a couple, um, is meant to indicate the parts of the building on a plan or section illustration that are within the walls, within the structure of the building. If you've done structural drawings before, you know there's actually a lot going on in there. Um, but for the communicative purposes of a plan drawing, what we want to be very clear about indicating is what are the spaces in the building? What are the positive spaces, square, square? And what are the negative spaces? What are the occupied spaces, the fireplace, the walls, the columns? Uh, and we call those occupied spaces poche, the pocket in which the structure and the mechanical systems of the building live. So again, there are a number of colors that we could use for poche, but one of the classic, most traditional colors to use, especially in a, in a French style watercolor architectural drawing is pink, believe it or not. Um, we have a particular problem with our poche color for this building too, because this building is a brick building and there's gonna be a number of colors or a number of areas that we're gonna to wanna to illustrate with a brick color. So not only do we have to make a pink color for our poche, which I believe we should, um, another option would be to make it black or gray or just leave it entirely white. We have whites though that we're gonna to wanna to preserve. So that's kind of out. And we're gonna to try to paint as much of the rest of the area as possible. So we're gonna go for pink, uh, but we have to make that pink different from the brick color, which is also gonna be kind of pink that we'll use later. So to do this, we're just going to mix a very, very simple mixture of alizarin crimson, alizarian crimson. Um, so uh, you should have at your disposal four colors for this class. You should have alizarian crimson, a lamp black, 
uh, this yellow, yellow ochre, and Windsor blue. There are many, many, many more colors uh, that you could use if you have them at your disposal, feel free. Um, but it is really kind of wonderful how so many of the colors we would end up using, or maybe even just buying for ourselves without mixing them, could also be made from essentially these four. Uh, so I'm going to try to show you how to mix all the colors we use from just these four colors. So please have these four available or something like them. And so yeah, to make this pink uh, and to make it truly kind of pink and not any more complex than that, all we're going to do is mix this crimson with a little bit of water. A uh, little bit of water goes a long way. I'm not going to make much of this color because the only thing we're going to use the color for is the areas within the columns and within the walls. And you can see that's really not much of the space of the painting or drawing. So already that's, let me see, that's too much water. It's like half the pretty small container. So I'm going to dump some of that out. Another thing thing that it's going to be very helpful for you to have while you're mixing colors uh, is a watercolor test sheet. Uh, watercolor test sheet uh, can be any old scrap of watercolor paper that you have lying around. I've stapled drawings to this board before, so I have old scraps still stapled to this board, but you can also get little pads of this paper. And if you don't have any of those things, that's totally okay. Assuming that you've stapled down more or less like I have, you can also test your colors just in the staple margin on the very same watercolor paper that you're going to use to paint, which actually gives you probably the most accurate sample of what you're going to do. Uh, last thing before we begin, your board, whatever board you're using to draw on, to paint on, should be slightly inclined. Uh, we sent out, I believe, uh, directions that included uh, some books that you could use to tilt your drawing. You want to tilt your drawing towards yourself just a little bit. I have two books at each corner, uh, relatively thick books, but nonetheless. We do that because we're going to, as we say, run, and I mean literally run washes down the page. And we're going to do that in a way that's going to leave behind very consistent areas of color. Later, we can go back and kind of make things more artistic and varied. But to begin, you want to just run these washes in a way that's going to leave behind totally consistent colors. So to do that, we do want a little bit of inclination, just enough so that I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, when we paint or when we leave some wash on the sheet, a bead accumulates at the bottom of the area. So here we go. You want to use your least nice brush, a kind of inexpensive brush to mix colors because you really want to mix it well. You don't want to damage a finer brush while doing that. I'm going to take a healthy dose of glycerin crimson. This is a kind of medium strong color. It's not a super strong color. And to mix it, I'm going to kind of smear it on the side of whatever container I'm using to paint, and then generously swirl it around. This is going to make a very bright pink. And you can see that here on the test sheet. It's also going to make a very pale pink. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about strength of color, um, strength of pigment, at least in the four pigments that we're going to use. Uh, this crimson, as I said, is kind of in the middle of the pack. Blue would have gotten us much further with that much pigment. Yellow, almost nowhere at all. Black would be essentially opaque at this point. But the red is in the middle. We do need to add a bit more if we want the kind of effect. This portion on the top half, you can see how the bead has kind of run down. This portion of the color on the top half, that's the color that your wash is going to leave behind. Not this darker color at the bottom. That, and probably even lighter as it dries. So. We want to do a little bit better than that. Another practice note as we kind of get warmed up and get ready to go. As you wash, really at all times when you have 
pigment and water near your drawing, you're gonna probably wanna have a paper towel in your left hand or if you, in your right hand if you're left-handed. Um, and that is your kind of immediate undo button. If you splash, um, then you can immediately sop that up mostly with a quick dab of paper towel. It's just kind of a, a safety blanket there, if you will. So uh, we are upping the value of our crimson crochet. Another dollop of pigment here. Same technique. Kind of smear it around on the side and slowly integrate it into the mix. Give it a good mix. Okay. We'll give this another shot. Normally, you wouldn't want to be doing this on top of your drawing, but because of the camera angle and wanting to be illustrative for everybody, I am, but I'm doing so very carefully. This is a good practice for the way we're going to wash. We kind of wet a line across and then draw the wash down as we go. Draw the wash down and just keep that bead, that leading edge wet. If we were done with this wash, if that were the area that we wanted to paint or color, a particular color, we would dry up our brush with a paper towel here and kind of reabsorb the bottom bead until it looked about as dark as the rest of the wash, and then we would let that dry. In microcosm, that's what we're going to be doing with the rest of the painting. I'm still not happy with that. I'd like it to be darker. This is going to end up looking kind of neon pink. Going for another dollop. So when these techniques were invented, uh, or at least refined in France uh, in the course of the 19th century um, and the early 20th century, when architectural drawings were produced with watercolor wash, they were produced with incredibly light washes. Uh, already our first darkness would be way too dark for them. And as opposed to doing one or two washes over the same area, they would layer up five, 10, 15 washes of extremely light individual value that would accumulate value over time over the same area. One of the reasons for that is that it helps you avoid mistakes if one of your washes blooms or does something weird or you go over the edges. It's only a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of the color you'll end up building up. Um, but another one of the reasons for that is that it, do, it does look different when you, when you build up washes like that. We have four hours, so we're trying to get this to a high value, dark color as quickly as possible, which is why we're going to use much darker colors. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking that. It's good. Okay. I wouldn't go any darker than this, to the extent that you can even tell how dark this is over Zoom. Um, but I'm looking for something like that. And I feel good about my crochet color. So I'm going to get ready to actually add this to my drawing. As we continue on with the class today, uh, if anything comes up for you, if you have any questions, please, as Kevin mentioned, feel free to add those to the chat on the Zoom call. Um, I can see the chat, and if I miss it, um, someone else will draw my attention to it, uh, and we'll be happy to help you out with anything that's going on along the way. Uh, I'm going to now wash my brush. Uh, I've done the best I can to get all the pigment out of it. Even though it's a mixing brush, I'm still going to take the time. It's very important. Clean water, soak it out again, lay it aside. Okay. Got a new paper towel. Capped up my paint tube. So we're going to work our way. I'm right-handed. Uh, so the thing that makes sense for me to do 
is to work my way from the top left of the drawing to the bottom right. And feel free to wait a little bit and watch as I go and then jump in as you feel comfortable. We're going to fill in all the areas of wall uh, and the areas of column and other little things that are being cut through uh, the screens along the colonnade, uh, pieces of the stair, the fireplaces, pieces of the stair back here. Uh, but that's just about it. Uh, we're going to fill those all in with this wash. And we're going to, as we mentioned before, kind of make, make the wash very wet and heavy and have that bead that kind of runs down to the bottom and then guide the bead around all the various corners uh, of the little shapes of wall that's being cut through. Uh, the challenging pieces of this, just ahead of time before we get into it, are going to be here. This is a big, long portion of wall that we're going to want to wash all the way down. We get everything to the left of it done before we do that. And this is a smaller one, but it's also pretty big. Um, so the point is to be as ready as possible and then to just keep going until you're totally done with each individual area. The longer you wait, the more likely is that the wash will creep back up through itself and do something we call blooming. So we want to be kind of in a meditative state. But in fact, it's really wonderful to not be able to pay attention to anything else but this. So here we go. I'm using kind of middle of the pack brush as far as all the various brush sizes that I have. Not the largest, not the smallest. In general, you want to try to use the largest brush that you feel comfortable using. The larger brushes will keep your washes wetter. And if they're wet, they're going to be more consistent. Now, again, I'm a righty, so it's going to be really easy for me to do clean vertical lines on the left hand side of painted areas and harder for me to do clean vertical lines on the right hand side. If you are a lefty, it's the opposite. Um, if you had time and you were so inclined, you could, of course, tape off each one of these individual areas. But that wouldn't really require much technique, or at least not much painting technique. So the little bits of wash are running over your lines. Don't worry about it too much. I mean, obviously try to paint within the lines, but already my washes are bleeding over just a little bit in a number of areas. And that's actually really okay. You're not intended to get this perfect. Uh, if you've done your work with your underdrawing, and we can go back and make that better too, as we have time, uh, your lines will actually optically resolve little mistakes. The lines under the drawing, under the painting, which are still going to be visible afterwards, will kind of hold the edges that maybe your paints have not always been able to hold. It's not an excuse to not worry about it, but I'm getting help from a couple different levels of the drawing. To be honest, there's not a whole lot of washing going on. There, you can see the bead kind of at the bottom of that area that I'm going to soak up a little bit. With areas that are this small, it's actually kind of hard to do a true wash. We'll see more of that later on. But work quickly. Work while the whole area you're painting is still wet. And you'll still be able to essentially achieve the effect of a watercolor wash. find yourself doing this later on recreationally, 
it's a great occasion for using the time lapse feature on your phone's camera. Fun to watch this unfold. Okay, here's the first big one. As we move forward as well, we just wanna lightly continue to stir our wash. This is gonna be even more important if we're using washes with any black in them. The black tends to settle out, yellow too a little bit. So it's important to just continue to agitate the mixture a little bit. Here we go. Starting very wet, and then I'm giving it kind of a place to go so it gets sucked down that area of wall. And now I'm going to give it a lot of room to run. And you'll see it'll kind of pull, if you've got your tilt going, it'll pull the wash down the kind of roadway you're making for it. I like to kind of make that path between the lines that I'm painting within and then expand it to go out and meet the final edges and kind of go back over. And as long as, yeah, as long as the whole area is still wet, you won't be able to tell where your brush strokes were. This is the watercolor equivalent of the glazing process and oil painting that kind of obscures brush strokes. I've got a lot of paint built up here. I want to make sure that stays wet as I go back and kind of work in these little details. And even as I add the water up here, it finds its way back down. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. So if you find at the bottom of that large area that you are still, you have a big kind of accumulation of darker wash here at the bottom, dry your brush and just go in and it's a bit of science called capillary action that sucks the wash, the water back up into a dryer brush and it kind of cleans it up for you. And you keep doing that until the whole thing kind of looks consistent. Now. As you work across, you're going to notice that the This is going to eventually look exactly like that. And so we'll continue. As we move through today, uh, there are no actual bonus points, but congratulations to anyone who figures out what significant detail of the original building I accidentally left out of my underdrawing. I was tracing CAD over a PDF and it didn't come through and I missed it.
let's go up here. This has a little partition wall next to the stair attached to it. So run a little wash down that wall. Well, there I dropped my brush, splattered a little bit. It's a good thing you got the paper towel right there. You can solve that problem. Another little vertical wall section. The other lines that are really kind of difficult for everyone to do consistently are horizontals at the bottom of washes toward you. So 
that's maybe one of the best places if you have a big wash coming down to a horizontal you're trying to keep clean. It's one of the best places to consider taping. And just use normal masking tape. Uh, I suggested a particular kind of scotch masking tape in the class materials. It's essentially the best. There are a lot of different varieties of scotch masking tape, but most of them are kind of hard to find. Um, the ones with the thicker crepe paper and the stickier adhesive are the way to go. Because the watercolor tape will hold up to a lot and you want something that really sticks so that no wash gets up underneath it. Okay, we're winding down here. Those are the wall segments. Now we'll move on to the columns. Important to not go in with too dry of a brush. Remember you can always soak some of the wash back out. That's what I'm about to do. If you go in with a very dry brush, your columns are going to look a significantly paler pink than your walls. In the small areas, that's the danger because you want to be precise, which a lot of wash makes harder. I'm doing my best to keep my head out of the shot, but occasionally you're going to have to look at my bald spot, so I apologize in advance. I'm going to fill in this screen on both sides. Probably should have done this one while I was painting those columns. It's not going to matter. But any areas that are going to be connected, connected, excuse me, you want to try to accomplish doing those washes all at the same time. I'm also going to fill in around the stair, which there is apparently some structure that we're cutting through and a closet below. And again, I might have done this earlier, but it'll be fine. These columns, if you've just done the row of them with me, uh, your first couple of columns are going to look dry. They're not. Uh, these washes actually take a, a good little bit of time to dry. So I'm moving through the drawing today. 
my strategy and the strategy you're going to want to follow is to not just to try not anyway to wash uh, any particular area that's directly adjacent to the other particular area you just have washed. So for instance, we're not going to go back now and do the grass right right away because the grass butts right up against these walls um, or the floors for that matter for the same reason. You know, give this a good long stretch to dry. Um, if for whatever reason you're on some sort of deadline, you're in grad school uh, and you need to get a drawing out right now, or you're trying to get something to a client, uh, the shortcut uh, to getting a wash to dry very quickly is none other than your friendly neighborhood hairdryer. Uh, these work wonders and they do a really good job. If you have not washed consistently, if you have a bunch of the wash gathered at the bottom of your area that you've just painted, this is gonna dry that in place. So you wanna make sure that the wash looks color consistent before you hit it with the hairdryer. I'm gonna try not to use the hairdryer, uh, but if I have to, for the sake of instructional reasons and moving forward, I might. So uh, we've completed our poche wash. Uh, if we do the rest of our illustration and we come back and we find that this is too light, of course, we can go over it again uh, with another round of the exact same wash in the exact same area. But I think this is going to work out well for us. Next question is, what do we do next? Well, uh, what we want to try to find, as I mentioned, is something, some area that is not directly adjacent to the wash and what I'm seeing is we have a number of paths. I'm looking, by the way, uh, at this drawing. Well, I can't share the screen with you. So uh, if Laura or Elizabeth, you're in charge of, if I'm allowed to screen share, at some point, if we could turn that on. I'm looking at uh, the National Historical Trust drawing of the site plan. It's called the plot plan. And it designates what areas are brick uh, and what areas are stone in the paths. Uh, so I'm using that as my kind of key. This area of this path kind of going forward is brick. This area appears to be crushed stone. Uh, all these areas over here appear to be brick. So we need a color for crushed stone. We need a color for brick. Um, Charles, I think I made you co-host if you wanted to share something. Um... Fantastic, thank you. Okay, here we go. Uh, everybody see the drawing that I'm looking at now? Yes, great. Uh, so as I mentioned, some materials are called out here. Um, this is, for instance, the pool. Uh, the front walk has been tagged flagstone. Uh, we've got a statue over here, which I haven't put in my illustration yet. Brick on this walk, and we assume the rest of this is gravel. It says gravel. Okay, back to painting. Just in case you were wondering where the information is coming from. So let's do a gravel color. Um, let's assume, as I've seen in some pictures, that we're talking about kind of a crushed limestone gravel, uh, not so much gray as maybe something warmer. So this is going to be a relatively easy color to mix. We're just looking for kind of warm and yellow. I'm going to rinse this container out. You want a new clean container yourself, your old mixing brush. And if at all possible, uh, if you have caps for colors uh, and piece of tape that you can use to label your colors, uh, it's very helpful just to keep track of things, especially in a very complex drawing that you're gonna have a number of different colors. Also just to keep it from spilling. Um, Colors that we mix uh, with especially fine pigments tend not to last very long. Shelf life of something you've mixed like this is gonna be a couple days. At that point, especially if you've used any yellow or black, you're gonna find that those pigments start to fall out of the mix into the bottom of your container. You can shake them very vigorously or you can mix them very vigorously, but they're still not gonna to be totally the same as they were when you first mixed them. And you're gonna find little clumps of yellow and especially black come out of the mix in dots on your painting. 
So essentially, the best time to use the color is right after you mix it. Uh, half. We're really only talking about this area. So pretty small quantity of water again. The reason for limiting the quantity of water as well is that it helps you limit the amount of pigment you go through. And we're going to use yellow pigment for this mix, and the yellow is by far the weakest pigment color. Um, yellow ochre is what we're looking for. And so if we fill this up with a lot of water, um, it's going to be fun to mix a big batch of this, but then we're only going to be able to use it for the path, and we will have used a bunch of our yellow pigment. And this helps us save. So big dose, probably even more than that, but starting there, smearing on the side of the container and then mixing in. It's going to look super bright yellow. We'll bring back our test sheet. What my mix is looking like right now, it looks like almost a pair of khaki pants. But it's going to look very bright and yellow on the page. So we're probably not done with just the yellow. Yeah, see, it's almost not there. It looks great guns in the glass, but you can barely see it at all at the top of the wash. And remember, it's the top of the wash that's going to be what it looks like. So I'm going to leave that there. Hey, Chuck. Hey. If I didn't draw that, do I need that color for anything else? If you didn't draw the path, uh, you shouldn't know. I don't think need the color for anything else. OK, cool. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, most of you at least have drawn something like what I had on my, on my drawing. If you did not, if you don't have a path, feel free to sit this one out, uh, let your crochet color dry, and brick is going to be the hardest color to mix. Um, and we're going to use a lot of brick, and that's coming. So if you find yourself without something to do at this particular moment, Go ahead and give a shot at mixing brick. You're going to want to use, obviously, a lot of the crimson, maybe a little bit of the yellow, and a very small amount of black, and see how that comes out. See if it looks like brick to you. Uh, use the same technique that we're doing here. Wash a little bit on a scrap piece of paper or on the edge of the drawing that you've got going on if you don't have any pads to fill in with this color. I'm going to continue with my path color here. And so this is a great note for any time that you're going to use black in a mix. Black is a great shortcut to getting a color to become more mature, uh, to become deeper, obviously, very quickly. Most of the time, almost all the time, you can achieve the same effect with combinations of blue and red um, added to the same mixture. But it takes longer, and it takes a very specific balance between those pigments. Black is this kind of shortcut around that process. But the black is the strongest pigment in our toolbox. And we want to use extremely small quantities of it, or else we will make immediate messes of whatever nice colors we're mixing. So I'm going to dab my mixing brush just in the black. That's probably too much, but it's barely there. And we'll mix it on the side and mix it in. And you'll see already it'll make much more of an olive out of the bright yellow that I had previously been mixing. Black and yellow together are the two worst colors for settling as well. So this is going to last for the next couple hours. And it's already after that going to start to settle out of the mix, make it harder to use, make consistent color. So one of the great reasons to use black, especially on watercolor paper, if you've got cold press watercolor paper that you're using today, is that the paper has this kind of tooth. It has this texture to it. And the black pigment does like to settle out of mixes. And so it's going to settle out unevenly in the little valleys and 
across the ridges of the paper texture. And it's going to give you something that looks a lot more like really any real or natural material, like gravel, like, like brick. Um, so that's a great kind of positive reason to use black, a, a reason in black's favor. And yeah, this is looking a lot more thrown up. It's not particularly dark, but then again, gravel paths aren't particularly dark. I don't want to belabor this, especially if not everyone has the path on their drawing. So I'm just going to dive right in, clean up my mixing brush. I'm going to use essentially the biggest brush that I have for this large area. And this is going to give us a great bit of practice at doing washes, a real kind of big wash, which we're going to do one way or another when we get to the grass, when we get to the brick paths, so forth and so on. Large brush, get it fully soaked in the mixture. And here we go. If you've done the border that I have here, you have a larger quarter inch line and a smaller eighth inch line. The goal here is to leave the smaller eighth inch space as clear of any pigment as possible to create a little bit of effect at the edge of the drawing. It's a clean white line and then the color of whatever border you're going to use, which for me is going to be purple. So we're just going to try to maintain those lines as we fill in this area of wash. This is a big area. I'm going to have kind of a sopping wet brush and I'm going to guard that with my paper towel as I bring it across the rest of my drawings. Of course, I don't want it to drip on the drawing. I'm going to guide this big bead of water down the path. I'm going to do my best to keep it wet and kind of keep it moving at a consistent rate down the path. And that's what's going to uh, create the consistent area of color. Now, classic problem. I went over the edge a little bit. I have a valley in my wash area, and some wash has gotten trapped in there. It's right here. So I'm going to dab up and soak up, dab and soak and dab and soak, and there it's gone. So what I'm doing is I'm just transferring that area of wash to the paper towel bit by bit. And now the rest of this is pretty straightforward. I'm going to continue to add new pigment to the wash as we go down, because you'll notice that the bead will dry up as you move it across more paper. Do your best to keep the edges as you go. And then you should end up at the bottom of the area. I've drawn a line that corresponds to the site drawing. You don't have this line on your CAD drawing. Reach the bottom of the area, and you get this nice bead of wash and then dry your brush a little bit and start soaking it up. Still got some wash trapped up here. I want to caution you against going back over your washes. If you notice that it's a little bit inside or outside the lines and it's far up in a region that you've just done, um, Go back in with a very wet brush. That wash is going to bloom into the partially dried areas of the wash, and especially in any kind of a color darker than this. I want to be careful about that. Um, blooms are totally normal in watercolor, and so to some extent, they're expected. But you want to maintain this really consistent color. Only really work at the wet edge of the wash, and don't go back until it's totally dry. 
Don't forget to wash your brush. My wash water is already quite pink. And now a little bit yellow. I'm gonna change that out too. Get ready for, yeah, we can do some brick next. So the next color we want to mix is a brick. Uh, if you have been working on that already, uh, excellent. And as I mentioned before, uh, what we'll want to use to mix this color is a combination of the red, the crimson, um, lamp black, and maybe a little bit of yellow ochre. So we see how this goes. Um, if you can also do keep track of your colors by labeling them as you go. I'm just going to take a moment to do that. This is my okay. So mixing brush, a little bit of water. This is going to be a good amount of our surface. We want to make a somewhat generous quantity of it. Still probably too much. Obviously, the majority component here is going to be the crimson. Our goal, though, as I mentioned before, is to keep this separate somehow from the poche color. And you might think that the poche color is there because it is a brick wall, right? And the inside of a brick wall is brick colored. Um, and that may be true, but the way that I've always thought about this is that pink is just the color you are probably least likely to paint anything in an architectural drawing, unless it's the inside of a wall. And so it's just a contrast color. Um, I think that's maybe more likely than pink being poche color because of brick, but it could be both, it could be either. It really takes a little bit of work to mix in a big dollop of color. I just dropped my cap. In the mix, of course. Okay. So the point is not to undermix. I want to really move it around. Now, if you do have access to some other colors, uh, something that could help you get to a kind of authentic brick a little bit faster is a burnt sienna or a light red, which is really kind of a red orange. Um, either of those two colors will get you a little bit further down the road, a little bit faster to making a brick color. But what those colors are, are essentially combinations or pigments that combine values, uh, shades of red and yellow to make an orangey or brown. So we're just going to accomplish that by adding the yellow ourselves. Now I'm almost out of yellow in this tube. I have another tube, but yellow, I think you'll find if you continue to paint with wash, 
yellow is the color you're going to go through the fastest, both because it's in a lot of architectural materials, a lot of stones, bricks, um, grasses, but also because it's the weakest pigment by far. It, you have to use so much of it just to kind of get it to show up. You can see it's barely made a dent in our sea of red here. And this red is already just going to look almost exactly like the crochet that we made before. I really want it to go in another direction. Continue adding dollops of yellow ochre. I've probably made too much of this. Yeah. And so it's just going to make it really hard for me to achieve the value that I want to achieve in any kind of short amount of time. And we're on a bit of a schedule. So I'm going to dump some of it out. And last wrinkle, see what a little bit of black does. We be slightly more generous with our black. Good dip of the mixing brush into the black container. And it's especially important to mix this well, smearing on the side, incorporating. So it looks different in the jar. It still looks very reddish to me. I'm cap up the black and still trying to push this in a yellow direction. Here's my new container of yellow ochre. You'll find too, if you squeeze on these metal paint containers that they'll keep going after you're done. So you just want to make sure not to put the cap on in a situation like this, but take it if you can take it or kind of crinkle the container to suck the pigment back in. If you put the cap on while the container is still oozing, it'll kind of freeze dry lock the cap on and it'll make it very hard to get the cap off afterwards. Okay. A little bit more black now. Okay, this is starting to look like brick. As I said, brick is definitely one of the hardest colors to mix convincingly. Part of that is, is that an actual brick wall has a bunch of different colors in it individually. And what you're trying to do is achieve the rough average of all of those colors, approximate that. If you have a brick wall fully drawn and laid out with individual units, you can wash it and underwash and then go back in and add some yellow and add some gray and add some white or even purple to some of the bricks and really achieve that true texture and finish, but we've not drawn in our individual bricks. I don't want to give you too much work. I'm just going to try to achieve something that looks like brick. So here we are on our test sheet. And we've got a nice grown up kind of maroon, uh, a little bit orangey. It looks different next to the poche. And we could do a couple things here. We could push this a little bit more orange. Uh, we could push it darker. Um, but 
what we want for this drawing is we want the structural elements to be the main show. We want them to be the main event. And because of that, we're going to leave our poche, hopefully, uh, as the highest value, the darkest, boldest color uh, in our painting, in our drawing. So it's OK if the brick is a little bit less intense than the poche. And if we want to keep pushing it orange, you can. I'm just going to go ahead with this color. I'm going to wash my mixing brush. And it, if you're frustrated with your brick or it's not looking authentic to you, you have my complete understanding and sympathy. I have spent at least a couple times in my life more than an hour mixing a brick color. It's tough. It's tough to really get it to look real. So lots of brick areas to wash. Let's look at what some of them are. Um, I'm going to get a new paper towel. If you have them, uh, all of these paths, this, 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 I've drawn a kind of amorphous shrub here in the corner. So we'll leave that out if you have it. Um, and then all the front uh, portico uh, in that brick color. Um, and then this portion of the path over on the left, which we're going to leave to last, because remember, we just washed this area here. And a little bit of a dilemma, too. Um, we have kind of two areas of the brick at the front of the house. We have the field, if you will, of the porch, and then we have the border of the porch. And if you look closely at the plan drawing, um, which I bet I can bring up. Uh, yeah, you'll see that the brick patterns are different. So bring this up here too. Well, uh, it's not immediately forthcoming. Um, in any case, you'll have to take my word for it. But the, the brick along the border here is laid in straight courses. So this course is going straight in this direction. These courses are going straight in this direction. The brick in the field here is laid in a kind of herringbone, um, long edge to short edge. So. Something else we can do is we can wash these areas of brick in a brick wash. Then we can go back and potentially wash the border areas in a darker or the field area in a darker brick to kind of highlight the way in which those patterns are maybe a little bit different without actually, again, going through and drawing all of it, which we're attempting to do here is create that first impression, right? Create that impression of what the building is and how it's put together at one look. Uh, so we don't necessarily have to draw all the lines to do that. We can also use differential color to do that as well. So uh, for the brick areas, I'm going to use my second largest brush. And I'm going to dive right in. If all you've got is your portico, uh, you can just worry on and focus on that. But when I get there, uh, do not color the bases of the columns, the square bases of the columns. Those are going to be white. The columns are white. We want to leave those white. In this case with pretty much any watercolor drawing or painting, it's important to leave at least some white to create contrast. So be careful with those. I'm going to start over here. And I'm going to start, I've drawn in a tree as well, and the canopy of a tree. I'm actually not going to color the brick underneath the canopy of the tree. The walk is drawn. Uh, the lines of the walk are drawn, so you can see where the walk would be. Uh, but I'm actually going to fill that color in with uh, tree green later. So I'm going to wash around it.
is that left hand edge. It's tricky for us right handers. Here's another big wash area. And so the philosophy remains the same. We want to keep the leading edge wet, keep adding wash to it, keep that kind of bead going, and then just draw the bead down across the area that we're hoping to wash. A number of brick walls on the property. I'm going to assume that this is one of them. And for those of you that have this portion of the drawing, this is the pool. We'll come back to if we have time. But if we don't, I bet you can imagine what that might be washed as. Okay, our wash area suddenly got a lot more horizontally wide. We want to increase the bead to encompass this whole area. And do our best with the left hand edge, if we can. I'm going to stop the wash against the border of the front portico, even though that's brick. It's going to be really hard to wash this whole area consistently. We're going to divide it up into pieces. I'm going to do this piece now. I'm going to do another non connected piece at the same time. We'll come back, we'll do the porch later. And when we do that, when we do areas of the same color at different times, it's going to kind of highlight and enhance the borders between them. That's helpful. Get this wash out of this corner. We're washing right over the shadow lines that we've made. It's going to be the last thing we do today is go in and add the shadows. And they're going to be added to whatever other pigment is already on the sheet. It's a different technique than what I suggested for the trees, which we want to actually paint the color of the tree over the line work of whatever is behind it. That way the drawing is there to show the architecture, but you're giving kind of interest and entourage with the tree. And I'm running into a flat horizontal at the bottom of my wash. So I'm going to be very careful now. Getting close to it, I'm going to stop adding new wash. In fact, I'm going to dry my brush and already start to kind of preemptively soak up some of the wash I have down on the sheet. And it's gotten nice and light there for me. And then I'm just going to be very careful as it comes to the bottom. And as it sits there, it might accumulate a little bit of wash. I can see it here in the corner. I'm going to soak that up as it comes down. Some more brick areas that we can wash right now. Uh, this front fence, the wall. Same on the other side. I've been a little bit less than thoughtful about my plan for these washes, because now I want to wash this path area, and it's across something that I've just now washed. That's OK. Just got to be a little bit careful about it. Be sure not to touch your hand down. 
in the area you just washed. Still a little bit damp, but I'm feeling good about that path wash. I feel like it's dry enough to not soak into or be soaked into by the brick that I'm about to lay down. I'm going to keep the brick away from it, though, at the beginning. Just get a lot of wash down onto the page, start to work out to the edges. And now I'll bring it up before it gets dry. Great. And the way that you know that it's dry enough is that the red is not like blooming up into the area of the other wash. And this is true of any, any wash. The more you do this, the more you get a sense for how long you have to wait and what it feels like. After it looks dry, it's almost always safe to touch a washed area lightly, back of a hand or finger to feel how wet it is, how cold it is, is usually the way to tell. All right. I've done these brick areas. Uh, one more brick area that I want to be sure to do is, let's just say, I've seen that some of the rooms in the building are brick. Let's say I think the floor of this room is also brick. It would be the kitchen of sorts. Don't want to overdo it with one particular color, but there's a lot of brick. And so again, I'm kind of painting across something that I've just washed. Be careful if you can, kind of. Lay the hand down, not over something that's wet at all possible. Keep out of your window sills. We're going to try to leave those white today. The window trim is white after all, and it's going to provide nice contrast for us. I'm going to stop the wash here. There. Yeah. We talked earlier about the fictive nature of the drawing. That was, in fact, we're kind of imagining that we've cut the whole building across uh, at a certain level. Other little elements of fiction are going to generally help you if appropriately employed. Uh, they'll help you describe something about the building. So another fiction that I am using in this drawing is that door swings don't have any floor patterns beneath them. I'm not using it everywhere, but you'll see in a couple of places that in the area of the door swing, I don't have anything of the floor pattern throughout the rest of the room beneath the door swing. It's here, uh, also there. The reason to do that is just to let the door pop out at you a little bit to highlight uh, what's happening. Um, so as we add color to the drawing, then we have choices about what we need to do. Um, I still think that this is going to be wood up until the edge of the brick there. And I think probably I'm going to want to fill this area in with brick. The rest of the floor is brick. 
it's going to want to be brick too. Okay. All right. Uh, a couple more brick areas. Um, front porch. And we'll leave the border until last, and hopefully the other areas will have dried. This is going to, we're going to want to do this very quickly. This is a horizontal, a broad horizontal wash. Um, and the quicker we work, the more even the color is going to be. If you wanted to, uh, you could also pick up your board and rotate it so that you'd be washing down a thinner area, which is a lot easier to do. I encourage you to do that if you want. I'm going to do this. I don't feel like picking my drawing up. I'm not going to do the border. I'm just going to do the kind of field of the front porch. I'm going to try to make it very wet, consistently wet, all the way across by continuing to add more wash as I go. This is a large brush operation. It does make it harder to get in and out of small detail areas, but that's okay. Work around the stairs as best I can. I've left this bead out here kind of for a couple seconds even. It's not wet enough. It'll start to dry and make an edge, so I'm going to keep working it. Bringing it down. See, it's nice and kind of dark across the whole bottom edge. You'll notice your paper will start to kind of buckle up. That's totally fine and normal. It will calm right down as it dries. Got plenty of wash on here now. Don't need to add any more. Bring it down to this horizontal edge. And yes, parts of that horizontal edge are also going to be brick, but we're going to do those at another time. Set aside our brick washes for now. Just so you all have this on your radar, we're going to take a break at 3, 2, 2 p.m. Your time. I'm in another time zone. Halfway through the class, just to grab a snack, take a break. About a 10 minute break. OK. There's a brick area. Yeah, I've not been totally perfect. You can see I'm over my lines here in a couple different regions. But this is OK. The more the drawing we get filled in, the more the pencil lines are going to come back to help you. And if you find after coloring in some areas uh, that your pencil lines are disappointingly uh, light, you can always go back over them with your pencil or lead holder and darken them up, especially we want the lines to be dark around anywhere that we've cut, right? That's the kind of architectural convention. Um, so absolutely feel free to go back and darken your lines. You will find that it's actually easier to do that once you've cut the drawing back out of, the, of having been stapled. Um, it's a little hard to draw on the drawing that's been stapled down. But if you have kind of an idea, I want to darken all the lines that are cut lines, uh, then you can go back in and do that once you've removed the drawing from the board after you've done finished painting. Okay, I'm going to take a break from brick for now. If you have a lid for your brick container, please cap it up, label it, do what you can. I do not. I'm going to put it far, far away. 
All right. And remember, uh, feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Or if you're uncomfortable with that, or for whatever reason it's easier for you, feel free to unmute yourself and just chime in. Happy to help in any way we can. Okay, we've got a number of brick wash regions drying. What can we do next? Yeah. Couldn't be doing. That's still wet. Okay, I think the thing to do is at least to mix a wood floor color uh, and to get started on painting in some of the wood floors. So, a uh, new container. Mm -hmm. a very small amount of water, an extremely limited quantity of wood floors. For these very small detail areas, um, traditionally, what we would do is wash each color as we've been doing it um, in our in a separate container with pigments from tubes. But uh, a shortcut to that, obviously, is using a palette. And these palettes are the exact same pigments uh, that I'm using. So this is my yellow ochre tube, and that's my yellow ochre pad right there. And they essentially do the exact same things. You can mix extremely small batches. So you can get a kind of container like this and turn out a number of, as you can see, I've been doing greens, a number of greens, uh, a number of different yellows, a number of different browns for texture and kind of variation very quickly. Um, that's maybe the next and a little bit more artistic step uh, as you, if you continue to produce paintings like this. We're just looking for a good wood brown. This looks, looking at pictures of the building, it looks pretty dark. It looks pretty kind of antique. Uh, so to do a brown like that, we're gonna want a lot of yellow again. I'm using one of my nicer brushes to mix, which is something I told you not to do, so. Maybe I'll stop doing that. I'm gonna finish mixing that first batch of yellow. The reason is because, yeah, the mixing process kind of takes its toll on the fibers of your brush. You wanna avoid that if you can. if you've invested a lot of money in nice brushes. Generally, I've been able to avoid spending too much money on brushes, except for the biggest one in my collection, which I did spend a good amount of money on because it's real animal fiber, which allows you to flick it to this really, really sharp tip, and then allows you to draw very straight lines, even with a huge brush and a lot of water, which solves two problems, right? Keep your wash wet, keep your color consistent, keep your lines sharp. Um, the bigger your brush, the more worth it, I think, to spend a little bit of money on getting really good fiber bristles. Um, we're making a brown, which means the next thing we're going to do is add a little bit of the red color. This is going to look very orangey. We've got two options for pushing this in a brown direction. We can add black and we can add blue. And there are kind of two different philosophies behind those. Black is the shortcut, but oftentimes black leaves us with a little bit of a, this lamp black anyway, leaves us with a little bit of a green cast. 
which of course we want to try to avoid. And then if there is a green cast, we have to work out of it with another pigment. Adding the blue uh, is indicative of a philosophy that says that basically mixing purple and mixing brown are essentially the same thing, just different degrees of the same thing. So the way we would mix a purple, obviously, is by doing red and blue. And we can mix a brown the exact same way, pushing it in more of a red-yellow direction. I'm going to take a little bit from both theories. Besides the black, the blue is the strongest pigment. Um, so it also will go a long way, a little bit. This is a kind of generous dab of the tip of my mixing brush. And it's going to, yeah, immediately take us to a nice dusty brown. Here that is. And as you make each one of these moves, it's a good thing to do to try to test the color on your test paper. I'm hopeful that I have some idea where I'm going with this, so I'm not testing it as much as I could be. Um, the black then is going to add just depth and value to what we've already been able to accomplish. Hopefully not pushing the tint in any particular direction. And be very, very careful with the black too. Just a little bit. Yeah. That's good. So let's see where we are. Using my mixing brush to do a little patch. Very light brown right now. Can probably go through that process again. Um, and if we want to, we can wash the floors twice. Um, I'm just going to continue uh, and use this color now. It's going to give us a light brown. It's going to be indicative of wood floors, right? We're just trying to get the drawing to read. Uh, and I'm going to use it in all the rest of the areas, the floor areas of the building, um, except for the main hall here, which we're going to use a checker pattern for. So. Um, because there is this open door here, these two areas are going to wash together. I'm going to keep the brown out of the hearth, the fireplace hearth. Uh, and I've interpreted these as windows, and so I'm going to keep the brown out of their windowsill areas, uh, flanking the main entrance axis. Uh, so brown, 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 white, white. And remember to keep your outer window sills white as you can. Uh, what the front door um, kind of barriers are is open for interpretation. So the problem of not actually going to the building. It could be brick, it might be brick, it might be part of the brick walls, it could be finished in wood. I'm gonna say they're finished in wood. Um, I'm gonna say that they are finished thresholds means that they will also be wood. I'm going to do this brown color. So mm, wash my mixing brush. Set it aside. And yeah, uh, pretty large brush for this. Maybe not the largest. This is your first time or near your first time doing watercolor washes. It feels probably a little bit safer to go with a smaller brush, and that's fine. Just make sure to keep your wash area wet. Make sure to keep adding wash to it as you go, uh, and that will allow you to produce a more consistent color. OK. I'm going to do something slightly dangerous. I'm going to put my wash container 
that's going to slide on the drawing surface. So I want to be particularly careful then of any drops that I make as I transfer the wash across. Getting something set up on my screen there. I lost you for a minute. Okay, here we go. Laura Thomas, who's been extremely helpful to me in, in getting this class set up for you, uh, caught me a couple times uh, last time we did this when I dropped some paint on my drawing. Uh, so it's nice when you have someone to spot you, but you have to keep your own eyes on your own drawings and make sure that you're not dripping. And if you do, just hit it with a paper towel. Here we go. I'm getting ready to execute my little through the door maneuver. Do the best clean horizontal that I can. Gather the wash in the middle here and then sneak it through. And widen it out again. Now, if you've done what I've done, you'll notice that your front porch is still kind of wet. So be careful not to put your whole weight, the weight of your hand, down on the front porch as you paint through. And I've left a little bit of wash stuck here in the corner. So I'm going to pick that up with our dabbing technique. All right. Tricky little corner here around the fireplace. As you maneuver around corners and otherwise larger wash areas, it helps to dry out that area of the wash and dry out your brush a little bit by using the same kind of paper towel, dab, and soak technique we've been using. And remember, I'm painting right over the lines of shadow for later. So I've got a little bit of excess here at the bottom of the wash. Stuck that up and I went over the lines there a little bit. Another great advantage of using relatively lighter colors around a darker wash like we've done for our poche is that if the lighter color goes over into the area of the darker wash, you're really not going to see it that much. Um, yeah. Not in here. I'll do my very best. So I'll start.
I'm not going to do the thresholds. Make them brown later if I decide I want that. I'm going to go into the stair. And if you have the same stair cut lines as I do, I'm going to not paint into the cut lines. Another great opportunity for contrast. So leave that cut area white. Don't want to neglect my main wash here for too long if the edge starts to dry. I'm going to set my wash aside. I've got enough to work with on the paper. And I'm just going to focus on bringing this down as cleanly as I can, not including the windowsills. I'm going to bring it through the door and up onto the tile or checker floor. Up against this brick room that we did in the back. Dab and soak out, accumulated a little bit. I'm gonna fill in the other portion of the stair as well. Try I haven't left any hanging wash there. And then one last room. We talked earlier about doing the thresholds, but I've decided to leave them out for now. Um, we can choose later about how to do them. I'm also looking at this and I'm thinking that the brick and the pochet are looking very, very similar. So one way to adjust that would be to actually go back over the brick uh, with some of this brown and that may work. Um, so if we have time to do that, we can, we can look at doing that later. But you don't really know what your colors are gonna look like until they get down on the page. Um, and I think the other solution to this particular uh, issue uh, would be to go back over the pochet itself 
uh, with the pink color to really make that pop and give it good contrast. But the thing that's going to solve this problem for us entirely uh, is that we're going to add in all of these shadows and it's going to make very clear what the portions of the wash that are structural um, are. So um, more soon, but with that, we've nearly reached our halfway point. So I'd like to encourage you to take a short break. Uh, it is 12.52. Uh, let's meet back here all together at, it's 12.52 for me, which means it's 2.02 for you. Uh, let's meet back, or 2.152. Uh, let's meet back together at 2.02 uh, Louisiana time. Uh, so just two minutes after the hour. Please take 10 minutes. Uh, It'll be 3.02. 3.02? Yeah. I can't do man. Oh. <laughs> yeah, great. Because it's one to five. Let's meet back here in 10 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.
Welcome back, everybody. I don't know if we have everyone yet. Let me give everybody a couple extra minutes. So if you have any questions, this is a great time to ask them. Um, feel free to just unmute yourself or type something up in the chat. Uh, for those of you that are back at your drawings and ready to go, uh, we are going to mix green or grass, which is something that I've been looking forward to this whole time. I hope you have too. Uh, it's going to give us a great contrast to all these reddish, brownish colors we've got going on. Um, so as people join back, let's get started with the green. Um, so to mix our, our grass green, we want to be especially heavy on the yellow and especially light on the blue. Obviously it's yellow and blue that come together to make green for us. But grass greens um, are greens that tend toward the yellow. Now, this of course is not necessarily true everywhere uh, as with Kentucky bluegrass. Um, and if you are in a very verdant area, as I know uh, Louisiana often is, then may your greens, your grass greens, are tending towards blue. Um, but for architectural convention, we like to show grass green as yellowish, so we can contrast it from other plants, uh, deciduous plants, which and coniferous plants even more, which we're going to want to show uh, as a darker bluish green. So a lot of yellow and a little bit of blue, and see how it goes. This is a pretty significant area of our drawing. This is going to be most of our drawing. We do need a good amount of this wash. It's not really going to be any more than that, I don't think. We're still in the kind of quarter cup or less quantity of water here, and we're not going to use all of that either. There's not a single wash we've made, even this path wash, which I tried to make a very small amount of. Um, you can see not a single wash we've made that we've used anywhere close to all of. So I'm still overestimating our quantities. Lots of yellow, some right around on the sides, as we discussed. We know how weak the yellow is. I'm just going to load up on it. We're never going to have a problem with overcorrecting in a yellow direction. For those of you joining back up, welcome back. Uh, what we're doing is we're mixing up a grass green. We're doing that with a lot of yellow. And a very little bit of blue. This is going to take a little bit of work. I want to preload the mix generously with yellow and then slightly with blue. And I'm mixing off camera, sorry. Very, very dark yellow here. This is three significant dollops. Don't do what I'm doing. Don't mix on your drawing. I'm only doing this so you can see what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, three significant dollops of yellow.
Now I have some sense, but let's see where this is. Not really going to mean anything yet, but yeah, it's still very weak. And to that, then you're going to add a very small quantity of blue. What can I do to make this more visible to you? That if I just lay the paper towel down, that would work. Okay, let me look on this paper towel. Here's our blue. I've had this blue for five, six years now. I've not even gone through half of it. It's that strong. Multiple tubes of yellow at this point. Here we go. So that was pretty much a brush tip of blue. And it's already maybe put us a little bit over the edge. We're in an olive green area right now. It's not a bad grass color. See what this looks like. Very light. It's still pretty yellow, so we can actually afford to go further in a blue direction. Very careful. It's just starting to look grassier to me now. And so since it's going to be such a large quantity of the drawing area, it's really fine. In fact, it's encouraged that this color be pretty light. For those of you involved uh, in our last class, this green, this grass green is going to serve more or less as the mother wash, as the kind of background color uh, for our drawing. I'm going to go a little bit more, just the tiniest little amount. Might be too much now. It's going to be fine. All right. This is a simple, this is a pretty simple green. Um, greens are another area where uh, you gain a lot, uh, at least of time, if you want to use direct green pigments. Uh, on the list of materials for the class, I've included a couple green pigments that will save you time mixing colors. You can buy in the palette version, the little dry blocks or in the tubes. I'm happy with this color, so we're going to start adding it. These are large areas of the drawing, so we're going to want to move quickly and keep our washes kind of loaded up. Right-handers, uh, we're going to work left to right, top to bottom, if at all possible. Left-hander is the opposite. Top to bottom the same, obviously, but work right to, to left. Hoping that we'll have enough time. After this grass wash and a couple other details, we'll go back in and we'll add a much darker, bolder green for bushes, for shrubs, um, additional details. But I don't want to assume that we're going to have time to do that. The most important thing to finish with, make sure we get in before our class is done today, is the shadows. That's really just going to make everything pop. We'll do this. We'll do a couple more details, and then we'll focus on shadows. Make sure we get those in. Uh, OK, so biggest brush. There's a really strong argument uh, for some of these areas for turning the drawing sideways. I may do that. 
You do not have to. Um, but what you risk is that, so for an area like this, I'm going to want to do green throughout all of this. I'm going to wash down and also be trying to wash sideways at the same time. Washing sideways is hard, especially across such a large area. If I turn it sideways and I wash this across and then down, that's probably going to go a lot better. Um, so we'll see. Um, am I going to wash in the areas of these trees? No. So that's actually going to save me a little bit because then I'm just going to do this area and this area and that area. If you have larger trees or tree canopy areas drawn onto your drawing, feel free to leave those empty of your grass wash. Um, you don't have to because the green, the darker green over the lighter grass green will go fine. But if you don't, then what we're just trying to do is fill in the field around the building anywhere that's not a path with grass wash, give a little bit of contrast. Not assuming that you have the same level of detail that I do. Okay. Biggest brush. Enough delay. Here we go. Let over onto the path a little bit, hit it with a strong dab. It's that right hand line. The righties, it's tricky. You know how to do this now. Just keep the leading edge of your wash loaded up so that it beads. And again. Here's a rather common issue. There was something on my watercolor paper that was right there, and it's holding a little dot of pigment. And there's really almost nothing you can do about it. Um, thinking about it as an error is, in fact, maybe not productive. Little variations in your wash are going to give you a sense of natural texture anyway. depending on how interested you are in naturalism. I'm going to stop adding wash to the area a little bit before I reach the bottom. Fill things in with what I've got on the page already. And then start dabbing out the bead there's any left. The end. All right, there's our first grass area. We can keep going. Most of you are on mute. This is a great time to put on a long song or an album that you like, just kind of zone out. There's a great drop right there. There's really nothing else 
you can do while you're doing this. And as I mentioned, I'm filling in around some areas I've sketched for tree canopies. So you'll see kind of large empty spaces on my drawing. But one of a number of reasons to do that is that it kind of isolates your wash regions from one another, makes it easy to complete each one as opposed to having to do them all as one big interconnected network, which as you've seen, makes things a little harder. So I'm really just dabbing and soaking to get that out of that corner. And then just keep going. Gonna make a straight right hand line. See a lot more of this wash I did above has gathered now. I can soak more of that up as it comes down to make sure that the color stays even. And as before, do try to, with each kind of reloading your brush, do try to stir your mix, keep all the colors suspended as much as possible. Even this early on, they will start to settle out a little bit. Okay, that's more than enough in this area.
I did not do such a good job with that horizontal. I'm just gonna keep collecting. I've already gone through a paper towel on these big green areas. Keep your paper towels clean and dry if you can. Just keep using new ones. Look at this wash up here. It's still gathering. Oh, that's what happens if you put your hand down in a wet spot. You keep soaking this up. Yeah, even if you do this, don't want to go back in and paint over it. It's really easy to mess up. You stick your hands in it and it leaves a little bit of a smudge, you're stuck with it. Also, if it's still wet, it'll start to fill in itself again. Okay. I'm trying to get around this. Maybe should have done that one first. All right. Down to it. I'll do my best to remember to not paint the pool green. Looks like it wants to be green right now. I'm seeing that on the zoom, it's kind of hard to see what the actual colors are because especially when they're wet, you get some glare. It's also just kind of washing everything out. Assume that the colors that you're seeing on zoom are about 15% more saturated in real life for me. But as I said before, the, the real Col de Beaux-Arts technique, the traditional French technique, is to just go as light as possible with each individual wash and then to build those up. This is going to be that shrub, so we're going to leave that. If you have shrub or tree areas that you've already indicated, feel free to just leave those out of this part of the process. I'm cleaning my brush, but I still got some wash to get out. Okay, those are our grass areas. Like everything else, we leave ourselves the opportunity to go back in, add value, depth, make a slightly different color of wash and go back over it with that.
I'm just cleaning my brush now. Got quite a wasteland of dead paper towels. Start fresh. So, uh, I think there's one or two more things to do before we add shadows. How are we doing on time? Got about an hour and a half, okay. Uh, let's add our, our checker floor. That's gonna be another very satisfying project. I'm gonna make sure that the border lines look decent. Let's do that, that'll be fun. So uh, unsurprisingly here, we're looking for a pretty small brush. Cap and label your green grass color if you can, set it off to the side. Hmm. Need a new wash container. One of the great problems of this process is having enough containers. You end up using whatever's lying around mugs. A couple very, very small mixing bowls. Okay. Um, let's do checker. This is just going to be a black and white checker. Uh, so we're just going to make a small mixture of black, which will really be gray. We don't want to overdo this and have it be out of keeping with the kind of value, general intensity of the rest of the colors on our sheet. Um, so as with black, as we've discussed before, it's really easy to overdo. Not going to mix with my painting brush. So very small quantity of wash, very small quantity of black. And we are going to test this. We're going to want to test this to be sure that it looks like the other colors. You can see in some of these green washes, which I didn't dab up the bottom bead of, they bloomed back into the rest of the wash. That's what this looks like blooming. Uh, and they contain within them then all the different pieces of the wash that are settling out. You can do that on purpose and it creates kind of different color areas within your wash and that can be effect you can use to your advantage. Okay, our black flooring. Pretty much just a little dip on the tip of the mixing brush. Mix that in. Let me see if I can do this in front of everybody. Okay. There I am. It just looks kind of murky right now. Probably still too late, but we just want to know. So it looks like that. Yeah, that's too light. That really is just light, light gray. So go a little bit more generous with the dip of the mixing brush. Second round. Remember that as you're testing your colors on the border or on scraps of paper on your testing block, um, it's the top of the area that you've painted that's the, gonna be the color in real life. That's still pretty gray. Okay, we're gonna amp it up a little bit here. And a very small dollop of black. Black is also one of those colors you wanna be very careful to mix. 
probably the most important color to mix with a mixing brush because little bits of it are going to get stuck in the brush. And if you use that brush then to paint, the bits will come out unevenly and it'll kind of scar the drawing. This is also a pretty good opportunity to, that's looking pretty good. I'm just going to go a little bit further. This is a pretty good opportunity if you are a fan of Prismacolor markers or Coptic markers or whatever brand of, of drawing marker that you might enjoy. It's a great opportunity for a little detail work to be done with a watercolor marker, a drawing marker. Um, because yeah, the process and the amount of time it takes to mix a particular color or mix a bunch of small colors uh, is significant and whipping out a little marker and filling in some details is not. You just want to make sure marker colors tend to be very intense. So you want to look for those shaded color, those 10%, 20%, 30% values to do a detail like this. Um, yeah, I'm satisfied that this is something like what I want. And for these very small tile areas as well, it's OK if the color is a little bit more intense because it's going to help it read. The larger the area, obviously, the less intense your color has to be to kind of read well and feel dark. There's actual darkness, and there's just the feeling of darkness. All right. Clean my mixing brush. Uh, I'm going to use a pretty small brush. This may even be too big. This is a number six. Yeah, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to go even smaller. If you have this floor laid out as I do, um, you have corner tiles up the center line across from the fireplace and up the middle from the doorway. And we're going to start, I'll start anyway with those as dark. You could also paint these purple or whatever other color you would like. But I've tried to space these tiles on based on actual drawings and, and photographs of the house. I'm sure they're not perfect. If you are using a small brush, take advantage of it to really get these areas done well. And there are a couple different ways you can do this. You can do what I'm doing right now, which is to kind of deed up wash in each of the tile areas. Or you can go in with a drier brush and you'll see toward the bottom what I'm doing and kind of color in each one more like what you would do with a marker. My front grass washes are just dry enough to be able to place my hand on them. If you're at all uncomfortable with that, or yours are still more wet, don't use a paper towel, but you can use a piece of paper. I've got a photocopy of the plan drawing here over those drawing areas, and that'll kind of keep your hand from getting into the wetter regions that you've just washed. It's a good shield. OK, I've got this line of tiles now. Some of them are darker than the others, so I'm going to go back in and soak up pieces of them until they all look about the same. A little bit of variation is great. A lot of variation you want to maybe try to avoid. And I'll do another row. So I've got my center row. And so now I know that the tiles that touch the walls, top and bottom, are going to be the black ones. So we can operate under that principle. 
can go really anywhere you want from there. Just kind of go next door. This is almost not washing at all. But we're still going to use our same techniques, causing the brush to be drier than the surface to soak up the paint, causing the brush to be wetter to deliver it. And now I'm going to soak up some of these that have gotten a little dark. And remember that as they continue to dry, they will get lighter. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about watercolor pigments. Um, we're doing this particular drawing or painting today, and we'll be able to bring it quite a long way and get it to read very well and communicate some architectural truth. Um, but there'll always be more we can do. Uh, and I'm sure we won't get to everything that I would want to do today or that you would. And that's okay. Um, if you're using the pigments that I suggested, the pigments from Windsor Newton or really any reasonable watercolor pigment, those pigments are, if not permanent, they're semi-permanent, which means if you paint what you paint today and those areas, those washes fully dry, um, what you've laid down on the page is gonna become almost immovable. If you really work it, uh, a lot of scrubbing with a wet brush, or if you take a Mr. Clean magic eraser to it, you will be able to lift up the pigment. But under any normal circumstances, that pigment is not going to come up. Uh, and what that means is you can leave certain areas of your drawing or painting to do for later. We're going to wash shadows over a lot of this, and the underlying pigment is not going to be changed. We can go back and paint new details into these wood floors underneath the shadows, and the shadows won't change. Um, so painting over already painted areas tends not to change the pigment you've already delivered, or at least not very much. You go in with a lot of water and a lot of brush strokes. You can lift some of what you put down, especially if it's very dark, which is a good reason also to not paint or wash with super saturated colors. It makes them harder to disturb or remove later. I'm kind of going through once and doing a rough fill and then I'm coming back and like really pushing it into the corners and evening out the darkness. And remember that your underlying line work, as long as it's reasonably accurate, will kind of correct for small errors that you make. So even at this level with a very tiny brush, not going to be perfect. Free yourself from that expectation. And with the black, remember to keep stirring the pot. It's going to settle more than anything else will. 
Ooh, that's dark. Okay, one reason that I'm doing this side of the room before the other side is that this is the side we're going to lay shadow down on. <clears throat> so we'll get that the way we want it, get it reasonably dry, and then move on to the other side. Now, if your big brush was truly pointy enough and you were confident enough in it, you could do this whole thing with the biggest brush in your kit. And you probably wouldn't have to re-wet the brush either. Before I go in, after collecting pigment from my container, I'm dabbing down a little bit each time on my paper towel to like dry up the brush a little bit before I deliver. Because like a fully loaded brush with these tiny, tiny areas is just going to come in and make a big bead and it's going to be hard to work with. So I'm over here, dabbing a little bit, going in. Sometimes I dab too much and you'll know that when the color is too light, I'll go back for more. And if you're disappointed with your level of accuracy, just sit back from your painting a little bit, take a look at it from further away, and it'll start to look a lot like a checkerboard. No one's ever going to be as close to this as you are. Fill in each square. I'm doing kind of six small strokes. It's kind of working well for me right now. Four, five, depending on how wet my brush is. Diagonal lines like this are some of the easiest for your hands to do, obviously, because the way musculature works, your hand is straightforward, you draw a diagonal line. Okay, that's a checkerboard floor. 
Obviously, you can save yourself from that particular work if you make a simple floor pattern. Um, but since there is actually a checkerboard floor in that room, and since you know we want to try to speak a little bit about the architectural detail of the space in our plan drawings, if we can, uh, we included it. And the hope is, is that once we're done, it really makes it look like a little dollhouse that we've saw the top off. Okay. So that's drying. We probably don't want to hit it with shade and shadow right away. Um, here's something easy that we can do uh, that is a, like a direct migration from the color that we just made. So uh, we want a color for our flagstone. Um, and the flagstone is probably going to be a grayish blue. So this is great. We have a number of colors that we've already made. Uh, and I think we have everything we need to easily create a grayish blue from our shade and, well, our, our kind of tile color, uh, which we've already made. So if you have another container, take a little bit of your, of your tile color, maybe about half of what you have left over, because this is also a very small area. And let's add an extremely small quantity of blue to that and see what happens. If you go too far, because blue is another very powerful color, uh, we can always dilute then with some water. So we're going to try to get the color right first. And then it's probably going to be a little dark, it's possible. So what we can do then is Bring it back by diluting it. I'm going to a good dip of blue. Smear and mix it in. I can see kind of that that's what I want. Let me get a paper towel so you can see what I'm seeing. I bring the wash up on the sides of the container. You can see that it's kind of yeah, grayish blue. And it'll probably be dark. That's OK. Yeah, that's a nice flagstone color. Uh, and we're just going to bring it back a little bit from that level of intensity by adding some water. There's very small volumes that I'm working with here. So it's really just a splash that I added. And this is going to be a nice bluish gray now. Yeah. As you can see. So uh, this is going to be a nice flagstone color. We have this pattern of flagstones on the front walk. And if you've copied my drawing, you have them too. And we could flat wash over this entire area and just call it good, but that would be kind of sad. So what I want to try to do is do something like what we did with our checkerboard floor, which is to leave more paint in some places than others. I may not be able to do that at first because they're all, you know, flagstones. But I'm going to go back later then and I'm going to add more pigment to some of them to get that kind of masonry type variation. Uh, I'm also going to paint our fire hearths uh, this flagstone blue, which again are in the area uh, that we're going to use for a shade and shadow. So Maybe I will leave those out and we will do that after the shade and shadow has dried. But just so you know my thinking, um, I would color those hearths um, the same kind of stone blue gray. For now, just going to make a quick wash of the flagstones.
There's a little border on the flagstones too. I'm guessing and assuming that that might be brick. I'm gonna leave that uncolored by this wash. Gather that as before and let it set. Mm. What else can I do? I don't know. We've got an hour. I think the thing to do at this point is to do our shade and shadow as that's drying, go back in and add as much further detail as we can. Um, so, I'm going to leave that there because we need to test. For shade and shadow, uh, for a drawing like this, um, first of all, I think that the easiest thing to do would be to just do another gray uh, variety of, of black, a mixture of black for the shade and shadow. and. That is going to be the easiest thing to do. So I encourage you, if you're uncomfortable with what I'm about to suggest, to simply make a mixture of black and water. Um, that is something like the mixture of black and water that you made for your floor tiles. If you have a bunch of the floor tile around, feel free to use that. Um, what I'm going to do is something different. Uh, as you may know, shadows can take a really wide variety of colors. Uh, they are going to take the color of really anything that's near them that's across from the area that they're, or the angle that the sun is coming from. So if the sun is coming from, again, kind of where my camera is up here on this side of the drawing, and the shadow being cast by this back corner of the building is going out onto the lawn in that direction, that shadow is going to take the color of this tree or this brick walk, or anything there that is available to reflect color into it. If, for instance, the sunset is really spectacular, uh, maybe after a storm, and the sky is full of bright, beautiful colors, uh, the shadows may take on those colors as well. So all of this is to say, you can make your shadows almost whatever color you want them to be. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that one of my favorite colors to make shadows is a dark and gray purple. Uh, so that's what I'm going to mix. Uh, feel free to mix a dark gray blue or just a dark gray for your shadows. Um, but I'm going to go with purple in part because it's one of my favorite colors. And so to mix that, I'm going to start with the purple. And then I'm going to add black to it. And then I'm going to back off if I've gotten too dark with adding water later. So you can see what I'm doing. Water first. Blue is going to give the purple its depth and darkness. Um, the red just pushes it in the direction of purple from blue. It's not going to contribute a whole lot to the actual darkness of the color. So I'm going to go very generous with blue. And if I do this right, I really actually won't need much black at the end. This straight blue here, this is great for a pool. We have a pool. You could even do that, sneak that in right now before we mix it any further. It's also a great sky wash, just straight blue. Uh, from my list, this is Windsor Blue Red Shade. Uh, this is, to my mind, the easiest watercolor blue to work with. There are others. Uh, someone on our last meeting uh, really enjoyed working with Ultramarine, which is a little bit of a bolder blue, a little harder to mix with. Uh, 
I liked that idea of doing a pool. So you see how dark this is. It's not too bad. That's pretty dark. Still, I'm going to give it a shot. And so because this is darker than what I want, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go very quickly. And then I'm going to dab some of it up afterwards. And if you do a very deep mix of this blue and put it down on paper thickly, you will see the red shade in it. You will see why it's called red shade. But I'm doing this because I just want a little bit more color contrast on the sheet. OK. You see how this is kind of darker than anything else on my sheet and bolder? Yeah, we want to try to avoid that if we can. So I'm going to let that dry a little bit and then hit it with paper towel. Meanwhile, we're mixing purple. So the next thing for our purple mix going to be red. I'm pretty generous with the red. And then I'll make a deep purple. Okay, our pool is drying up now a little bit. So we're going to hit it with paper towel. If we do it evenly, it should lighten right up. And there it did. Meanwhile, See how we're doing with purple. This is going to be pretty dark. Yeah. OK. I like the darkness of it. It's very vibrantly purple. And I want to subdue that a little bit. So this is where black is going to come in. Uh, I'm going to add lamp black to darken and kind of gray that out a little bit. Then. Uh, I'm going to dilute it a little bit because that's probably going to end up being a little bit too dark. Let me see what a dollop of, that's too much. Smaller dollop of lamp black will do to this. Remember black doesn't just darken, it has some unexpected tint to it, usually green. So don't assume that it's going to leave your color unchanged. It's very important to mix carefully. Yeah, and that purple just got a whole lot more grown up. I'm going to go a little bit further. And I might actually move a little bit back in a blue direction too. I'm looking a little, little Barney-ish. Nothing against Barney. I'm 
Yeah. That's starting to look like a real shadow color. Okay. This is going to be incredibly dark. Remember, we're going to dilute it before we use it. That's a great purpley, bluey shadow. And so, yeah, now what we want to do is we just want to make it a little bit less intense. I've added, I don't know, something like a third or a quarter of the total water volume of that mix to it of relatively clean water. And we'll see what happened. It's still going to be pretty dark. Yeah, very dark still. I'm going to add back a little bit more. Another way to do this is that you can get rid of some of this mixture. This is getting pretty full. So I can lose some of my mix. As you do, be incredibly careful to dab up on the sides of your container if you pour it out. And that's going to increase the effectiveness of any water that you add back into dilute. Add another quarter to an eighth more water volume. I'm assuming that you have the same issue as I do. If you don't, if your shadow color is now looking about as dark or maybe a little bit darker than most of the rest of the colors you have on your sheet, you're good to go. We are lightening up now. Can I go any further? I don't think so. Just a little bit. Okay. I'm going to call that good. It's going to be a nice dark shadow. It's going to be slightly purpley. More than slightly. And get everything clear. I'm going to use a solid medium sized brush for these washes. Uh, this is pretty technical. Uh, if you followed along with the lines that I gave you for these shadows, um, there are some kind of goofy corners and so forth. If you're wondering how to do this, how to cast these shadows, uh, what I'm assuming uh, is that there is a sun or light source, obviously, up here where my camera is, shining down on the cut open building and it casts shadows at 45 degrees in both directions. So 45 degree down, 45 degree back. Um, for more theory on how to actually cast the shadows and what portions cast what shapes, uh, you can look to the McGoodwin book on Shade and Shadow. Um, we'll include that in a post-class email with some recommendations. But essentially, we're tracing every edge 45 degrees down in plan and 45 degrees over uh, 45 degrees down in elevation, 45 degrees over in the plan, uh, and then recreating the shape, this circle over here, and connecting it with those lines. You can do that. You can cast your shadows uh, after you've done the rest of your drawing already on watercolor paper. We did that last time with the elevation, but so many of them with this drawing sometimes it's easier to draft them with the rest of your drawing. So here we go. This is going to be another fairly important wash to keep an eye out for drips. I'm actually going to lay a paper towel down by where my wash is going to be. Use this 
masking tape to actually keep the container level on the tilted surface. That works pretty well. And we're just filling in these areas. Um, in the casting, as the shadow is being cast, it's cast in a straight line from the corner that's casting it. And it's cast in the same line in plan, no matter what the elevation of the surface is. When the shadow hits the surface, uh, it will move depending on the elevation of the surface. So here's the shadow of this wall down on this floor, and it moves in because this windowsill is higher back here. But enough on theory. Let's get shadow. What we're really hoping to do here is keep the shadows out of the poche wash that we did earlier. This is an interesting one. This actually comes all the way down this wall. We should be able to see now that we are shadow casting over existing washes that you'll still be able to see the color of those washes behind the shadow. So you'll be able to see what you've done. We could continue that all the way down, but it kind of comes to a point. So we'll stop it there and fill in some of this stuff. We still want to try to be careful as righties to work from top left to bottom right, or as lefties to work from top left, top right to bottom left. So we're not painting over areas we've already painted. Right. So these are still pretty dark. I probably could have diluted this a little bit more, but it's okay. They're going to dry. They're going to lighten up. We might go back, make the poche darker.
And after all, the point of them is to be dark, is to provide the contrast. And they're definitely going to do that. I see that I have not quite finished a shadow detail. But this shadow is coming over from here. So it's kind of yeah, this whole area is just going to be in shadow. We could get persnickety with it, but I'm just going to say that this whole kind of closet area is going to be in shadow. Now, we painted some of the edges of the closet poche earlier. So we want to see what we can do to not paint over those. It's going to be hard. They're very thin. Um, but we're going to try. Start on the shadow outside the stairs. Get a good bead going. Hmm. Could have done this better. That's okay. This isn't exactly how it would look in real life. Now casting a block shadow for the stair. There would be probably a little area of lightness in it there, but kind of failed to realize that. You can see where that stair should have been light in that direction. Try to show it to you. Be like this. Not perfect, but kind of gets the point across. And then in the closet underneath the stair, we're just going to continue. Behind the screen. Behind the column here, 45 degree angle. You can even do little stripes here next to the pedestals because we assume that those are at a little higher angle. But 
we'll get to that as we move across. Okay. Where shall we go next? Let's do some of these areas here. Get our first real column shadow. And these are very fun, but if we go too far across, we'll be painting over them, so we don't want that. Okay, it's tricky to see against the checker, but there is a pretty complicated shadow for this region, and it looks like this. Started at the bottom, which is not exactly traditional, but I'm kind of coloring, I'm not really washing. This is when the purple is going to look really cool against any white that you've left. We're going to go back in and we're going to fill in these hearthstones with the flagstone blue. But still, the white of the checkerboard is going to look really good. So, something like that. Bottom will probably have accumulated some of the wash sure to keep drawing that off. Now we continue. Stair shadow is a little strange. So it's being cast from this corner of the wall here. And it moves up into the stair, creates the shape of the wall edge. And then it's going to go down the stair at that level on the first on the landing, and then right over to the wall for the rest of the way down. And we're going to paint it up until the stair break and stop. And because the front shadow is just being cast and it's not landing, it gets to be a straight line across all the stairs. All right. This is the one that skips up onto the window.
and we'll fill in some of the rest of these. We've looked very closely at the edges for these shadow areas. You'll notice that any edges on the casting side get turned into 45s, uh, but any edges on the kind of shaded side are reflected pretty much as they are in the cast shadow. The leading edge will create the 45 degree angle, but the tailing edge will just cast its shape onto the surface behind it. I'm going to do this whole area here now. And what we hope at this point is that the drawing really starts to make sense. You start to see the pochade areas popping forward at you uh, from the drawing surface. We made a number of assumptions too in casting these shadows, like the stair railing is solid, which we know it's not. Uh, we could have cast those individual balusters, but then back here it would have been solid. It's kind of simplified for our purposes just to show massing. Um, I made the decision to cast the shadows this far, which implies that the cut is happening somewhere five, six feet up, which it certainly wouldn't be. They're kind of a little bit more dramatic. Uh, to give us these larger, darker regions to set off some contrast. You too will have to make choices like this. If you want to construct a drawing that's similar, and your choices are very often between realism, naturalism, like exactly how it would look, and communication and simplicity. There are no door surrounds in this plan either. Um, it's a choice that you have to make all the time in architectural drawings. What is it important to communicate with the drawing? What level of detail is appropriate to that kind of communication? Just a couple more to go. Mm. 
Another step that we can take in a future wash on the same drawing would be to start to introduce some reflected light into the shadows. So it's kind of an optical thing, but your shadow is going to look its darkest at the edge. And so you can suggest lightness closer to a surface like the wall that might be, might be reflecting light from another source or reflecting reflected light from another source. So we can build up some pigment along the edges of our shadows and leave the inside lighter to suggest that kind of reflected light. It's called a graded wash, something we did more of in our elevation class. Ah, I can see we left an area over here that we could have done green and white. Okay. There are going to be all sorts of levels and layers that you can add to this after we're done. What I hope is that this gives you a rough idea of what your options are and how to lay down a wash so that as you perfect and refine your particular drawings, whether this particular drawing or drawings you do in the future. You kind of know what the options are and you can do that planning step, which is probably most important to watercolor, being able to kind of imagine what your options are and what the possibilities are. professor in grad school used to say that even if all your drawing has is lines and shadows, it still does so much to communicate massing and function and intention. All you have time for beyond the line work is the shadows. That's what you should do. And I absolutely turned in some drawings that were lines and shadows. Rather pretty presentation, to be honest. Also, again, with this screen, just kind of assuming that it's solid and casting a solid shadow. And that the level of the border of the brick area here is the same as the level of the court, which it probably isn't. In which case, the shadow would jog a little bit further back if that's lower. Okay, we're approaching the end of our class. So approaching the end of our shade and shadow casting, which is great. Uh, there's definitely one additional thing that I want to add to the shadows before we're done with them, which is that the windows will have cast, the wall beneath the windows will have cast some shadow uh, onto the floors. And I didn't add those in before. A bit of an omission, but we're catching it. The difference is going to be the same difference as this window. It's about a quarter of an inch. So we come a quarter of an inch back. From the absolute edge of the shadow. 
And I'm just draw a little sketch line in only for the windows. And I missed a window here too in my underdrawing. A quarter of an inch. Don't do this at the doors. The doors we assume go all the way down. Let's fill those in, see how that looks. I'm going to do these because we've just washed these areas. I'm going to do these with a relatively dry brush, but they should be pretty dry back where we started. Just fill them in. I'm not including the windowsill. And again, why are we doing this? We're doing this because the wall beneath the windows is going to cast a little bit of shadow. We want to show that the windows aren't going all the way to the floor. The line that I'm using for this is a quarter inch back from the extreme flat edge of whatever particular shadow I'm casting. Okay, I've got those areas filled in. What else can we do? We've got about 20 minutes. Let's go back and make a little bit more of these flagstones and maybe fill in, I know what we can do. We can fill in the border or the thresholds of the doors with flagstone. That'll be a fun thing to do. Your flagstone mix should be a part of your checkerboard mix. And we're going to start by doing what we said we were going to do, which is to just give the flagstones we laid down a little bit more texture. I've got black all over my hands, so just beware. The best thing to do is wash those so that you're not unintentionally dabbing black. So 
here, let's just take every other flagstone or every third flagstone and leave a little bead of water behind in it. Kind of in the corner if you can. Paint some of them whole. Paint part of some of them. Leave a little bit of texture. And then kind of trace the lines around them too, if you like. I'm using a pretty dry brush. Once we've done that, we go back in and lay down our fireplace hearths. We're going to do so right over the shadow, but only if the shadow is dry. I'm going to let the shadow dry as long as I can. And do it over my doorway thresholds. And this is not necessarily because the doorway thresholds are flagstone, but it's because we want them to stand out. They're kind of participating in the wall. We want to give them special treatment. Got thinner ones in the back here. Right. I think it's safe to go over these shadows. They're a little wet, but they're not bad. And you can see that just because we did the shadow first and the flagstone later, you'll still be able to see both colors. especially as they dry. This is one of those rendering order things to keep in mind. It makes more sense to do shadows first or do an overlay color first. You can actually go back and add the quote unquote underlay color afterwards and it stays pretty good. And our walkway looks much more convincing now as flagstone with some variation in it. Let's also, in our remaining time, let's go once more with our brick. Now, if your brick has been sitting around for a while, it will have settled, so be sure to mix it well. Keep up with your brush cleaning. And yeah, I'm going to what do I want to do here? I think hmm, I think what I want to do is make a new color. It's going to be slightly different. Actually, the last container I have in my kitchen. I'm going to make it 
from the brick color we previously mixed, which the first thing we need to do is mix it very well. As I described to you. Which is, yeah, looking a little bit reddish to me. There it starts to turn the brick again. I'm going to take a little bit of the brown color we made for our floorboards. And I don't want to get rid of all of this brown color. This is potentially useful to us as a last minute detail color too, to make some more variation in those floorboards. So hold on to your brown color. Don't lose it entirely, but mix it up. And if you want to do what I'm doing, just combine a little bit of your brick. You want to preserve a little bit of your brown and see what that looks like. That looks more like brick. Looks like a good rich brick. I'm going to use that on the border of our portico. It's going to set it apart a little bit just for some contrast. Pretty big brush here. When you mix two colors, of equivalent value, they don't get darker. They pretty much stay the same value. Something to keep in mind. Color X is mixed to a certain darkness and color Y is mixed to a certain darkness. Put the two of them together, they're at the same darkness. So remember as before, we're gonna keep this off of the column bases. This brush is a little big for me. So I'm going to move down one level in size. Give me some more control. I'm going to line the front walkway with brick as well, as we discussed earlier. Starting to look pretty done. Um, so one of the last details, I guess, that we have left are these trees. And we have a couple options. We can cheat and just use a green, which I'm tempted to do here, a pre-mixed green to make a bluer tree color. Or we can take the green that we've mixed and push it bluer. 
to make those areas. So first of all, I want to make sure that we don't need our current green anymore. We're going to use the same container. And I really don't like the idea of losing colors, so I'm not going to discard the green or mix all the green. I'm going to mix part of it. Get it mixed back together. Your yellow will have settled onto the sides of the container, so really get in there and kind of scrape the sides. Kind of bring back that color. And pour off half of it, say, portion of it. Since we did this, I've noticed a couple more areas. This is one. And I'm painting even under the shadows. And this tiny little corner is another. But say you've got your, your green areas filled in. To make that more tree-like green color, we're just going to add a little bit of blue. We'll make it darker and bluer. That went a little bit too far. The thing we have to do now is add yellow. This looks pretty good. It's not perfect, but we've got 10 minutes and I want to put some trees on the drawing. So again, I think this is a really good opportunity, like the flagstone, to do a wash and then to come back again and add a little bit more contrast or detail or variation. But because we're kind of running out of time, uh, all we're going to do is lay in this slightly darker slightly bluer green, anywhere you want to. I've seen in photographs and in drawings, there are planter beds around the outside of the building. Certainly that's one. So you can lay in little kind of bush shapes all around. Uh, I've got this big shrub here and these two larger tree areas there. So I'm just gonna fill them in liberally with this color uh, and then go back into those areas later if you want to add kind of leaf globs and so forth. That's all we're going to do. This is our last wash of the day. You can have fun with it. As the underdrawing did, you can also add suggestions of branches by using line work or
also by drawing through some dark brown lines with a thin brush. This is another great opportunity for a graded wash to do a series of dilutions of this green color and build them up from light to dark on the edges. Big brush and a very tight clean. Kind of touch it as lightly as possible and drag the bead out of the corner. You can see the yellow settle out of this mixture even in these washes. Partially because it's been sitting there for a couple hours. And remember, before we set this aside from the path, which is theoretically brick, but we set it aside because we knew the tree was going to come in over it. There's certainly enough wash on the page now. Soak up some of the edges of this. There's certainly more that we can do, um, but that's going to be where uh, we leave off for today with the painting. We've got a couple more minutes, and I see already one question. Uh, in the question bar. So let's take a couple minutes for any questions you might have as you all perhaps finish up your drawings. Mark asks, can I speak to whether or not annotations are typically done in this style of plan? Uh, they absolutely are. Uh, if you've been truly faithful to the drawing that I sent out to you to trace, there's a scale, uh, uh, visual scale here in the drawing. Uh, this kind of drawing would also include or could also include a simple title block, uh, a complex title block, which is its own um, particular you know, area of the drawing. Uh, it would definitely include a north arrow, which you can get into all sorts of details um, with the north arrow itself. There's a long tradition of extremely complex and fanciful north arrows. Um, but yes, I mean, it's entirely appropriate and typical for a drawing like this to include a scale, a scale figure, a uh, north arrow, uh, a notation of the scale, and a notation of the title of the drawing. Um, so all totally reasonable to include. Uh, they weren't included today uh, by me simply as a factor of time and the focus wanting to be on the main drawing. but. We're thinking about presenting this drawing not as an artwork, not as a gift to a client, but as part of a very normal, uh, standard architectural presentation. Um, that this would be a way to simply present a plan drawing and to do it with this kind of a rendering.
Any other questions? Feel free to type and or unmute yourself and speak up. So uh, hi, this is Dan Bear. I have a question. Okay. What would you say would be a good resource for, uh, you know, finding out how other community members render different types of materials or like, you know, just to kind of research different ways to apply the color to the page? So, uh, yeah, I can send you in, in a couple different directions. First of all, any book about watercolor painting is going to give you uh, a lot to work with. And specifically, it's going to give you a lot to work with at this point in the process. Say you've done what we've done today. You've gone through, you've assigned kind of a material in your mind to each one of the areas of the drawing. You've flat washed all the same color, uh, each of those areas to indicate, you know, this is what this is. This is poche, this is brick, this is checker floor, that's a tree. Um, the minute that you start to incorporate traditional watercolor painting techniques like dry brush and kind of more graded wash, um, the more you can add to, we just started to do something like that with the flagstone, kind of texture, depth, um, the more that you can start to add to, yeah, reflected light, suggest leaves on the trees, you know, leaves on the bushes, waves in the water, blades of grass, and so forth. So first of all, any good book about painting watercolor will help you out a lot. Uh, the other thing that I can tell you to do is look for videos posted by the University of Notre Dame uh, of their students doing these drawings, uh, because there are a bunch of them. And they will show you a wide variety of different uh, ways to render a plan, render an elevation, uh, render a material. You'll be able to see plan drawings that have been rendered um, with white poche plan drawings that have been rendered with black poche, um, each one obviously a different kind of thing. Um, but in general, what we're trying to do with the rendering process is to pick a color that approximates what the material is and use line work uh, to communicate something more about the individual texture and materiality. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if that's it, um, I'd like to, again, thank Kevin Harris and Laura Thomas, Elizabeth in the front office, and everybody at ICAALA for having me. It's been such a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed the class and you have something that you're somewhat proud of to look at and move forward with from here. And thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Oh, thank you. And uh, this was a, an amazing uh, uh, expose on, on or lesson on how to do the, the water coloring. I mean, I have one of my interns uh, at the table next to me and he's never done it before. And his, uh, his floor plan just looks amazing. So thank you again. And uh, we can all improve and uh, we will all improve, but this is a tremendous head start to get us, uh, get us on that way. And so thank you again, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Laura and everybody. Uh, uh, again, this was from the uh, Institute for Classical Architecture and Art, Louisiana chapter. And uh, we look, we have uh, two more sessions coming and look forward to having you uh, join us. Uh, 
uh, please feel free to email us uh, at any, uh, any questions you have, and we'll be happy to respond and look forward to seeing you at our next video. And uh, sometime in the future when we can uh, get past COVID at our next uh, foray and uh, do some touring of historic buildings. So, Laura, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think that's about it. But thank you everyone for joining. Um, and then just a reminder, the next one is on April 17th. Um, it will be the building section of the same house, the Shadows on the Tesh. All right, excellent. Thank you all again.